Welcome to County Road 189, the haunted stretch of road that runs right through the middle of Bearheart Nation. I'm your host and co-pilot, Josh Bearheart Hawk, and in today's episode, we're talking about man versus machine, author versus AI. What is the role of AI in the future of the creative writing process, and how's it going to impact us as authors? So buckle in, keep your eyes on the road, and watch out for ghostly hitchhikers. All right, so if you're watching on YouTube, this is going to be a little bit different for you because I'm actually trying something new. I'm putting some video in with this. <laughs> I don't normally do that on YouTube because I've kind of been against adding video to a podcast. In my, in my eyes, a podcast is, is truly just audio, and it doesn't involve video. If you want to make a video podcast, you're making a video. But I wanted to try something a little bit different this week and see... How it works and what people think about it and if you if you all like it out there in youtube land let me know in the comments section down below but for all the rest of you out there if you're listening on youtube music or apple or spotify or amazon music or wherever you get your podcasts at thank you for joining me you'll get the audio only version which in my opinion is the better version <laughs> so what do i mean what, what are we talking about here with ai and everything so if you've been paying attention over the past year or so, you've really seen AI explode. You've probably heard about chat GPT at some point, and it's just been this big, big thing that's kind of taken over pretty much the entire world. And you've heard all kinds of crazy things about it, whether it's going to take over, <laughs> it's going to take over all your jobs, or it's going to do this or that, it's going to be bad, it's going to be great. There's a million different ways that you can look at this. And what I wanted to do today was kind of take a step back, look at AI from a standpoint of other technologies that we've seen in the past coming up, and then take a really good hard look at whether or not these kind of things can really keep up with human uh, creatives, artists, writers, that kind of thing. And, you know, just kind of <laughs> compare and contrast a little bit. Uh, for me, what I've done is essentially taken and I've written I've written my own story, which I do every week. Well, almost every week. I've missed a couple of weeks ago, but <laughs> that's sometimes that's gonna happen. But just about every single week I've I've got a new horror story, short horror story out on YouTube on Friday nights. And what I wanted to do was kind of compare what can AI do writing a short horror story compared to a human, a human author who has been writing short horror stories for a while. And just kind of compare the two. And I want to see whether or not people can tell the difference or tell which one's which. So, <laughs> and, and you might think it's going to be easy, but it's actually going to be a little bit trickier than you might imagine. But let's step back first and talk a little bit about something that happened in the 90s. So I'm an 80s kid, 80s, 90s. I, I really hit the stride of my childhood in the 90s, but I was born in the middle 80s. <laughs> so I've seen a lot of technology come along. In my lifetime, we've had different video games, different computer technologies, and the biggest change of all was the internet. Now, in the internet age, when it first came up in the 90s, it was scary for a lot of people. Um, there were people that thought it was evil. There was people that said it was going to be, it was, it was satanic. It was going to cause all these problems and all this chaos. And it was going to be this horrible thing. And, you know, just really talking down about it. And then on the other side of that coin, you had people that were praising it as the greatest invention in, in human history and talking about all of the benefits that came with it. And even today, if you look back at some of the videos that came out in the nineties, talking about how to use the internet, a lot of those videos go over some of the things from <laughs> like the, the scary parts of the internet, but it, it lightly touches on them, but it really goes big on that. You can, you can buy concert tickets online. You can book travel online. You can do all of these things that like back then was like this foreign concept. You know, if you wanted to book travel, you typically got a travel agent or you called the hotel ahead of time and, and booked a hotel or whatever, wherever you were going. So the idea that you could go on to a website and do this all from a website was a completely foreign concept. And people were people were thinking, you know, this is going to be great. If you know, where's this going to go? The possibilities are endless. Uh, for me, <laughs> I was in a household where 
my mother was kind of on the the side of it's bad, it's evil. And a lot a big reason for that was my my father, <laughs> my biological father, had he was big on computers, technology, that kind of stuff. And he had actually cheated on my mom, met this woman online all the way across the country in California. And it was a big deal, and it wound up being the, the one of the big catalysts for them getting a divorce. So from that point on, <laughs> my mom was very, you know, internet's a bad thing. It's not, you know, you don't need the internet. You're never going to use it. She, we had to get permission slips signed so that we could use the internet at school. Because back then, you had computer labs, and in those computer labs, you had access to the internet. And if you wanted to use the internet, you had to actually go in and <laughs> your parent to sign a permission slip saying you could use the internet for research projects and stuff like that for some of the stuff we were doing. Well, her her thought process was internet bad, you need to stay off of it. And she told us basically, you can go in the library, you can learn how to use the file system, <laughs> the Dewey Decimal System to look up the books you need and use the good old fashioned way. And it was it was so backwards thinking and it was one of those things that really it held us back. And especially, I think, me more than my brothers, although they were they were kind of held back, too. But because I was the oldest, I, so that was a big part of my life that was kind of stunted. Because by the time she got over that, by the time the school stopped asking for permission, my brothers were, were starting to come of age. So I kind of got held back from some of that stuff. And we started kind of using the Internet a little bit uh, when we got into the early 2000s. And it was something that was still such a new concept and then by the time she passed away in 2005 you know youtube was starting up and we were getting we had facebook was on the horizon and it was kind of starting up myspace and myspace had already kind of died by that point but <laughs> basically there were two camps there were people that had adopted the internet took it on full force in the 90s and had really capitalized on it and really and really used it to their advantage mostly from a business perspective, but even from an individual perspective, you know, people starting blogs and people starting, you know, YouTube channels when YouTube first started and doing, I don't, I don't know that podcasts were out yet. <laughs> I don't know when the first pod, when, when podcasts first started, but you know, those kind of things that people were, were kind of, the people that had adopted it early were the ones that really took off with it. And when the internet, when people finally got over the, the, the worry about it and it became a part of our everyday lives, those people that had adopted it early were the ones that were really running with it, and everybody else was rushing to catch up. And I was in that weird phase where I wasn't necessarily, I was kind of rushing to catch up, but I wasn't really because I, I had kind of grown up with it. I, I was aware of it. I did my best whenever I got the opportunity to use it. I didn't get all the opportunity to use it, <laughs> but whenever I could, I did. So I was one of those kids that like as i was, as i got to be an adult i started thinking to myself you know i need to really kind of try to keep up with things and it's it's a losing battle at times because there's the one side of me that is like oh my god why do we need this this new technology this is this is crazy why are we doing this new thing uh that kind of falls in line with things like tiktok for instance you know tiktok <laughs> i absolutely hate short form content i really do but it's kind of the wave of the future uh, for a lot of different things. Uh, people's attention spans aren't necessarily shorter, but they, they, they want quicker hits. You know, they don't want to sit around forever and, and sit through an hour long video or a podcast. A lot of people still do, but the, you know, a lot of the younger generation as they're coming up, at least in their late teens, early twenties, they're all sitting there like, ah, I don't want to sit through that whole thing. I'm just going to get this quick hit and I'm going to move on. So something like TikTok or YouTube Shorts, that's new technology that I've kind of learned to embrace a little bit. I'm still not fully on board with all of it. <laughs> but as a marketing tool, as a content creator, as an author, I'm trying to learn to use this stuff to really keep up with the world so that I don't fall behind. You know, I'm already starting from behind, actually, because I should have gotten into the YouTube game like 10 years ago. I'm, I'm rushing to catch up at this point, you know, because at this point, if you are starting a company and you don't have a ton of money to throw into advertising, you're you're way behind. If you're starting a YouTube channel, if you're starting, if you're an author or whatever you happen to be doing, 
you're starting way behind if you didn't start 10 years ago and if you don't have a ton of money. You know, if I had $10 million, I could have a million subscribers on YouTube in a week. All it, all it is is throwing a bunch of money in advertising. They're, they're the people are out there, they're going to click. So it's, it's kind of this weird situation where you kind of have to rush to catch up. So that brings me to AI. <laughs> when ChatGPT was first announced, or when they first started talking about it, I was hesitant. And the biggest thing that I was worried about was, one, what's it going to do to creatives, to writers, to artists, to photographers? Like, what's the implications there? And two, like, what's the risk? You know, how far does this go with this AI technology? And what kind of barriers and what kind of things do we run up against? So I was, I was hesitant to get involved in it at all. And honestly, I started playing around with it a little bit. I signed up for an account with ChatGPT back in, I think it was April, February or March, maybe. It was sometime around when the journal came out because I actually used AI to help write the back, the back cover for the journal. And <laughs> for me, that was, that was something new. And I wasn't sure exactly what I was doing, but I was like, you know, I laid it out. I said, you know, this is the story. This is what it's about. Uh, this is who I am as an author. Like, what should I do? Give me, give me some ideas. And it spit out this really cool back of the book blurb that I was like, okay, this isn't so bad. But from that point, I, I still hadn't really gotten into it. And then recently, when my buddy approached me and asked me to help him with this company, you know, that we're working on together. And he said, you know, I'm founding this company. I want you to work with me. And I want to use AI. <laughs> and to me, I was like, I, I don't know about using AI. I, I don't know. Because basically his, what he was seemed to be doing at first was kind of just going in there and saying, write me this thing. And then it would write his, the whole thing up. What I didn't know is that he was tweaking a lot of stuff afterwards and stuff. So he's making it more of his own. But to me, that was still like, ah, uh, this is kind of touchy. Well, as we've been going with this and as I've kind of dug more into it and actually gotten more familiar with it and worked with it more, what I've realized is that it can be utilized if you use it the right way, especially as a smaller content creator or a smaller company, you can utilize AI to do things that you would normally have to pay somebody hundreds of thousands or t tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to do. And this is everything from drafting legal documents to, to marketing stuff. I've used it for a lot of marketing stuff recently. Um, honestly, I jumped into it <laughs> here in the past few weeks, especially I've really jumped into it to the point where I'll write a, a, a baseline for a post and say, this is what I want to say. And then ask it to pop out something, you know, use this and pop out something that's a little more snappy, that, that, that's a little more that people can see that's going to be eye catching, that kind of stuff. All the stuff I'm not good at, you know, I'm taking marketing. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the middle of a marketing course, but I'm not the kind of person that's good at coming up with that kind of stuff. And so I've used it and the more I've used it, it's gotten to know me a little bit and it kind of has gotten better at putting out stuff that I'm, I'm happier with on the first go around, but it's, it's all stuff that is using what I, it, it, whatever you put in is what you're going to get at. So I'll put in, you know, two or three paragraphs of this is what I want to say in a post on Facebook or LinkedIn or wherever it happens to be. And give me something that's, that's more eye catchy, you know, more, I need eye candy. What I have right now, because for me, I like to sit down and I like to read in depth posts that have, if it's chunks of words, that doesn't bother me. But for most people, it does. So what I do instead is say, okay, here's my chunk of words. Give me something that most people are going to be okay with reading. And it spits something out. And so far, it's been doing great. Uh, engagement on posts and stuff like that is up on the posts that I've used this for because it's more catchy. People are seeing it and they're catching on more. And it's one of those deals where it's kind of a fine line there. But it's no different, honestly, than me having a marketing manager and saying to that marketing manager, okay, go out on social media and, and, and really hype up my stuff. You know, hype up my stories, hype up my channel, whatever. 
and having that marketing manager come up with that. It's the exact same thing. It's just I'm having AI do it because honestly, if I could afford to hire a marketing manager, I would. <laughs> but I can't afford to hiring a marketing manager. I'm 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 making not much per month off of social media, to be completely honest. But <laughs> I'm hoping that changes eventually so that I can do things like hire a marketing manager, that kind of stuff. So <laughs> I've been using it for all of that kind of stuff. I've I've actually tried the the art generation. Uh, with with Bing, Microsoft has actually teamed up with I, I forget the name of the <laughs> there's a there's a major generator out there for for images and I can't remember what it's called, but Microsoft has teamed up with them, and they've kind of built this this image generator into Microsoft Edge, and I use Edge because it uses less resources than Chrome. I know everybody else out there probably uses Chrome or Firefox. I use Microsoft Edge, and. I thought, you know, I'll, I'll try the gener the image generator. And there's been a couple of times it's been it's been kind of good. Uh, if you want a scene, if you want like, um, <laughs> you know, for the for the story I released a couple of weeks ago called it was called the jumper, and I've I created a scene using that image generator. I created a, a guy using that image generator that was okay. It was passable, and it worked for what I needed for a thumbnail, but. If you need it for anything really getting in depth, like one of the stories I released recently, I was trying to get a good, I was like, I wonder if I could get a good picture of this person I'm creating, you know, this, this entity I'm creating. And it was terrible. It was horrible. And honestly, I wouldn't use any of it for commercial stuff. You know, if I was selling these, I wouldn't generate an image and then sell it. Uh, partially because the quality is just not there. Maybe eventually the quality will be there. But again, like, is it right to take work away from artists? And Because artists have a hard enough time. Artists struggle enough. And we're dealing with the situation in Hollywood right now, which is a big deal, with the writer's strike and the actor's strike, where they're fighting to keep AI out of the writer's room. Because it's, <laughs> it's coming to the point where Hollywood executives could sit down and, well, the executives wouldn't do it because executives hardly do anything. But, like, they would, they would order somebody to sit down and come up with a script using AI. And you could literally tell AI, I want a script with camera direction and everything for this type of movie, and it would generate it. And they're trying to get to the point where they can take that script and then plug that into another thing that would create all the scenes and create all the actors, like have it all be 100% digital. And so that's what the, the, the writers and the actors are fighting against right now, and rightly so, because as an artist, it's hard enough to make money, let alone... <laughs> when you're competing against AI. And so for me, it's a very shaky kind of line there. Like, where do you, where do you not use things? How do you not use things in certain ways? And so I've kind of shied away from using it for any purposes uh, for creative kind of stuff. But what I wanted to do with this episode, like I mentioned earlier, is kind of go into the pitting an author like myself who I have written a ton of short horror stories. I have a published author with a, with a novel that's out there, another book coming out soon. So I've got plenty of experience under my belt for writing. What if you take a seasoned writer and pit it against AI? What's going to be the result? And so <laughs> I did that. So I wrote my own story uh, that came... Okay, if if you watch my YouTube channel, you've already probably heard this story. <laughs> depending on depending on whether you watch this pod or listen to this podcast before or after that, you'll probably already know. But if this is the first time you're hearing it, that's great because this will be a good experiment. Basically, I wrote my story, I'm editing it up the way I always do, and then I had ChatGPT write a story. And I'm editing it up and doing it the exact same way, like I would do any of my stories. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play those two stories for you. And I want you to go into this blind if possible, but I want you to listen to both of these stories. And one, judge the quality of, you know, go all out. Try and think to yourself, like, is this story good? Is this story passable? Would I be, you know... <laughs> In, in any other circumstance, would I read this story? Would I, would I want to listen to the story? Whatever that happens to be. 
So, so judge it from both of them from that angle. And then ask yourself which one was written by a human and which one was written by AI. And I'm not going to reveal that until the very end of the podcast. So we're going to get through both of the stories. We're going to talk a little bit about each one. And then we're going to go into it <laughs> a little deeper and discuss which one was AI, which one was my story, and how I feel about this coming out of it as a writer. So <laughs> without further ado, what we'll do is we'll, we'll get into the stories. I don't want to talk too much about them prior to, but I'll, I'll give you the names of the stories. And afterwards, we'll talk just basically uh, very briefly, and then we'll go into the second story, and then we'll kind of talk about both of them, go back and forth, and I'll tell you which one was which. So the first story here is called The Whispering Garden. And it's I I really like how this one came out. It was a pretty decent story. I really liked it. So we'll go ahead and get that one playing and then we'll come back and we'll talk just briefly and then we'll go to the next one. So here is The Whispering Garden. Elliot Thompson always had a fascination with the unseen, the unexplainable. Ever since childhood, he'd collected stories and artifacts from old homes that were said to be haunted. As he grew older, this passion turned into a profession. He became a paranormal investigator. In his small Ohio town, Elliot was known as the guy you called when strange things happened in your home. From creaking doors to whispered voices in the dead of night, he'd seen it all, or so he thought. His most intriguing case came in the form of an email from a woman named Annabelle Collins. She had recently inherited an ancient mansion from a distant relative, a place with a history as dark as its hallways, known to the locals as Larchwood Manor. She described unexplained phenomena, sounds of footsteps, and a chill that would grip the air without warning. But what caught Elliot's attention the most was the tale of the weeping lady, a ghostly figure said to haunt the estate's abandoned garden. Elliot's curiosity was piqued. He packed his equipment and set off to Larchwood Manor. The mansion itself was a monstrous edifice, its walls covered with ivy, windows like hollow eyes staring into the abyss. But it was the garden that drew him in. Overgrown and wild, yet filled with a melancholy beauty. As he delved into the history of the place, he discovered the tragic story of Evelyn Larchwood, a young woman who had died under mysterious circumstances in the garden a century ago. Her spirit, it was said, had never left. Elliot spent days investigating, capturing strange readings on his equipment, hearing whispers in the night, but the weeping lady eluded him. On the fifth night, as a full moon bathed the garden in an eerie glow, Elliot found himself drawn to a stone bench beneath an ancient willow tree. And there, in the shadows, he saw her. The weeping lady, her ethereal form draped in a tattered gown, tears streaming down her translucent face. Her eyes met his, filled with an unending sorrow. Elliot's heart ached as he approached her, she seemed to beckon him, her voice a soft whisper in his mind telling her story. She was innocent, wrongly accused, her life taken in a fit of jealous rage by a lover. The garden, her sanctuary in life, had become her prison in death. Elliot knew he had to help her. Using a ritual passed down through generations, he attempted to free her spirit. Days turned into weeks as he worked feeling her presence, her gratitude. Finally, on a cold, clear night, he felt a shift. A warmth replaced the chill, a lightness the heavy air. The weeping lady was free. Elliot left Larchwood Manor, but a part of him remained, intertwined with the mystery and the beauty of that haunted garden. Years passed, and the story of the weeping lady became a legend, a tale to be told on dark nights, but for Elliot, it was a memory 
a moment of connection with the unknown. He continued his work, his passion undiminished, but he often found himself gazing out the window, his mind drifting back to the garden, to the lady, to the feeling that even in the darkest places there could be understanding, compassion, and peace. The garden remained untamed and beautiful, and if you were to visit on a moonlit night, you might still feel the presence, a soft whisper in the wind, the lingering touch of a soul set free. The story of the weeping lady might have ended there, but there was a twist to the tale that even Elliot Thompson could not have predicted. Months after his experience at Larchwood Manor, Elliot began to feel a strange pull, a longing that he couldn't shake. The weeping lady's presence lingered in his thoughts like a melody stuck in his head. Her sorrow, her freedom, the connection he'd felt, it was all hauntingly real. He found himself drawn back to Larchwood Manor, this time not as an investigator but as a man in search of answers. The mansion stood unchanged, its ominous facade a dark contrast to the beauty of the garden. But something was different. The air was charged, the wind whispered secrets, and the ancient willow tree seemed to beckon him. Elliot explored the garden, each step guided by an invisible hand. His senses were heightened, the colors more vivid, the scents more intoxicating, and then he found it a hidden pathway leading to a secluded glade. At the center of the glade stood a stone pedestal, and atop it a journal, weathered and worn. It seemed to be waiting just for him. The journal was filled with the words of Evelyn Larchwood, the weeping lady herself. Her thoughts, her dreams, her love, her despair, it was all laid bare. Elliot was transported to a time long past, walking in her shoes, feeling her emotions. Evelyn had been a poet, a lover of nature, and a woman trapped in a society that didn't understand her. Her love affair with a man beneath her station had been her undoing. A jealous suitor, a vengeful family, a tragic end. But the journal revealed something more. A secret, a hidden treasure, a legacy meant to be found. As Elliot delved deeper into the mystery, he discovered clues leading to a hidden chamber within the mansion. Guided by Evelyn's words, he embarked on a quest that took him through hidden passages, solving riddles and uncovering truths. He was no longer just a paranormal investigator, he was a treasure hunter, a seeker of justice. The chamber revealed itself in the dead of night, under the light of a new moon hidden behind a bookshelf in the library, a door passage to the unknown. Inside, he found Aladdin's cave, filled with artifacts, paintings, and jewels. But what caught his eye was a locket, a beautiful golden piece adorned with a delicate painting of the garden. The locket contained a hidden compartment inside, a tiny scroll, the last words of Evelyn, a message from beyond, a plea for understanding and forgiveness. Her story was not just a ghostly legend, it was a timeless tale of love, betrayal, and redemption. Her words reached out, touching Elliot's soul, urging him to share her story, to right the wrongs, to bring her peace. With a newfound determination, Elliot decided to honor her wish. He turned the mansion into a museum, a tribute to her life and her art. The garden was restored, her poetry celebrated, her love story told. Visitors flocked to Larchwood Manor, each touched by the beauty and the tragedy of the weeping lady. Her spirit, once trapped, now danced in the wind. Her voice was a soft whisper in the garden she loved. Elliot continued his work, his life forever changed by the connection he'd made. He knew that the unseen was not to be feared but embraced. The ghosts were not just echoes of the past, but messengers of timeless truths. Larchwood Manor became a symbol, a place of pilgrimage, a testament to the power of love, understanding, and forgiveness. And if you were to visit, 
If you were to sit on that stone bench beneath the ancient willow tree, you might feel her presence, hear her whisper, see her tears. For Evelyn Larchwood, the weeping lady, lives on, not as a ghost, but as a muse, a guide, a friend. Her story is our story, reflecting our fears, our dreams, our humanity. It's a reminder that even in the darkest corners of the world, there is beauty, there is hope, there is love. And it all began with a man, a garden, and a connection that transcended time. Okay, so that was the Whispering Garden. <laughs> and I, the reason I liked this so much was because the way that it comes out in the end there with <laughs> talking about, you know, it, it kind of brings it full circle. And it's, and it's kind of, even though it's kind of a ghost story and it's kind of a, a creepy vibe to it, it still kind of has that like happy ending type of feeling to it. And so I was happy with, I was happy with it overall. <laughs> the second story that we're going to get into is called I Accidentally Summoned a Demon. And this is a story that's, is, you'll see a little bit more creepiness to it. There's a little bit more edginess to it. And yeah, so <laughs> let's, let's jump into that one real quick and then we'll talk about both. So this is I Accidentally Summoned a Demon. I used to love working third shift. There's just something special about that time, late at night when everyone else in the world is sleeping, that makes me feel truly alive. Ever since I was a teen, I was what you would call a night owl. Sleeping all day, staying awake all night, it drove my parents crazy. They thought it was just a phase, but I never grew out of it. So I guess it was more of a personality flaw. Because of this quirk, I knew early on that I would need to find a job that fit my sleep schedule. I worked for a time as an overnight clerk at a gas station before moving on to stocking the shelves at a chain store and finally finding my calling as a security guard. My first security job was guarding the gate for a factory. I worked from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. four days a week and loved every second of it. The truckers that brought the overnight deliveries were the best people I've ever met and the law of activity in the wee hours between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. were a welcome time to play games on my laptop or read. From there, I moved on to become the overnight guard at a hospital, where I worked shorter hours but more days a week. I didn't like that one as well, mostly because of the patients and the fact that it was pretty active even in the middle of the night. People don't stop getting hurt just because it's late, and weekends were even busier thanks to those individuals that couldn't handle their alcohol. My next security job was probably my favorite of all time. I was the overnight guard for a zoo, getting to see the animals up close on a regular basis and explore the place when there was no one else around. That was the job where I also met the most amazing woman I've ever known. I would have married her and stayed at the zoo until I retired if not for a change in management and the fact that she turned out to be already married. After that, I took a couple of months to myself before landing my most recent, and probably last, overnight guard job. Something you should know about me other than the fact that I'm a night owl, is that I absolutely love horror movies, books, and games. Anything scary I'll pick up without a second thought. I don't care how gruesome or lame it is, if it says horror anywhere on it, I want it. I always dreamed of working as a night guard for some creepy place. Bonus points if it was quiet enough for me to read a book or watch a scary movie in peace. It was about three months ago, and I was browsing the web for job openings, hoping to land something cushy for a bit. I had only been searching for a couple of hours when I spotted the post that would change everything. Overnight caretaker slash guard wanted for historical building. It seemed like the perfect gig at the time. 12 hour shifts, seven days a week, great pay and benefits. It was everything I could have wanted. I called the number on the ad 
spoke to someone named George, who apparently watched the place during the day, and set up an interview for the following week. I wasn't expecting the building to be quite so creepy, and I definitely wasn't expecting to see a cemetery on the property. As I climbed out of my car, I was convinced that I had actually stepped out of reality and into a horror movie. Vines climbed the brick walls that must have seen at least two centuries pass. There weren't a lot of windows that still contained glass, though they all appeared to have bars to keep people out, or maybe in. As I climbed the stairs, I imagined the front doors swinging open to reveal doctors and nurses waiting to sweep me in and lock me up. The old brass handle felt warm as I grabbed it and pulled, a gust of cool air releasing from inside as the portal opened. I nearly forgot why I was there as I peered into the entrance hall, complete with a large staircase leading up to the second level and an extremely shiny vinyl floor. I stepped in, the door closing behind me a little louder than I expected, and made my way into the first door on the right as I had been instructed to do when I scheduled the interview. The room was clearly equipped as a modern security center, with several monitors hanging on the wall next to the desk and a TV and radio sitting off to one of the corners for those really slow days. To my surprise, George was nowhere to be seen. I wasn't sure what to do at first, wondering if maybe I had written down the wrong day or time. But as I was about to turn and leave, I heard footsteps coming through the hall outside. Mr. Lawrence, welcome. I'm glad you found the place okay. Have a seat, he said as he strolled into the room, motioning toward a chair near the desk. The actual interview was shorter than I anticipated, with a job offer coming in the first ten minutes. Apparently there had been several applicants, but only a couple of them had made it through the front door and I was the only one who didn't appear to be scared of the place. I actually kind of like the building. It reminds me of an old hospital in a horror movie, I said. Funny you should say that, because it was actually used in filming a small budget movie a few years ago. Something about a family moving into a house that turned out to be haunted. It was actually pretty well done for having hardly any money to film it. The building itself did used to be a hospital. It closed down in the 50s and sat vacant for a lot of years before the guy that owns it today bought it to fix up as a historical site. He has crews out here a couple times a month working on various things. You'll be working overnight, like the ad said, and mostly just keeping an eye on things. Our former night watchman retired, his last day was last Friday, so the sooner you can start the better. There isn't really a lot that goes on here, and we've only really ever had to chase people out a handful of times. I told him I could start that night and filled out all the requisite paperwork, excited for a chance to check the place out. He showed me the break room, where coffee could be found any time, and donuts were brought in once a week. A brief tour of the place revealed the building was larger than it looked from the outside, with a full basement where I was told ghostly howls could be heard at night. This last part I took as a joke, though I couldn't really tell if he meant it. The first few weeks on the job went pretty smooth, and I was really starting to settle in. I explored the building inside and out, and even figured out that the ghostly howl George mentioned was caused by the change in air pressure between rooms in the basement. Everything was going great, and it was quickly becoming one of my favorite jobs, at least until I found the book. I was wandering around the second floor one night when I decided to have some fun. There were these old wheelchairs up there, and most of them seemed to be in fine working condition, so I pulled one out and started running up and down the hallway with it. I would start at one end, pick up some speed, and jump in the seat and see how far I could coast. It was more fun than I should have been having at work, but my inner child needed to get out. On one of these runs, I misjudged the angle the chair was facing and wound up toppling out and smashing into a wall, making an awful large hole. After I recovered from the wreck and realized what I'd done, I started to panic. How would I explain the giant hole in the wall without losing my job? As I contemplated the lie I would need to come up with, 
I spotted something protruding from the space that now existed between the hall and one of the rooms. Reaching my hand in, I felt the leather cover of a large book and pulled it out to find ornate decorations and a title written in what I assume was Latin. That should have been my sign to put the book back and just walk away, but apparently I had not paid enough attention to the movies I had seen involving that exact scenario. Finding an old book hidden away is never a good thing, and opening and reading it might as well be a death sentence. As the cover peeled back, I knew right away that nothing good could come from the thing. There were crudely drawn pictures of what appeared to be people being tortured, and the whole book was written in some kind of weird script that might have resembled something from the ancient world. As I rifled through the pages, I came across one that caused me to stop and stare. I'm not exactly sure what happened next, but the weirdest sounds I've ever heard in my life started coming out of my mouth. I think I might have even blacked out for a couple of seconds, but when I came to, I found myself standing there in front of a man with a red goatee, bright purple eyes, and what looked to be horns on his head. He kind of reminded me of a car salesman with his hair slicked back and a full business suit bringing the whole look together. You have no idea how long I've been stuck in there. Thanks, bro. What can I do for you? He said, a smile crossing his face as he spoke. Uh, who are you and where in the hell did you come from? I asked, nearly falling to the ground. Where are my manners? I'm Theo. I'm what you might call a demon, though we're not what you all make us out to be. I was trapped in that book by a priest in the 1700s. He was just mad because I turned his wife into a chicken. I was bound to serve him until he locked me away. Now I'm yours. My demon? Well, yeah, like I said, we aren't really what you all make us out to be. I have to serve a master here on Earth until they die. I normally get passed down to offspring or sometimes handed off to friends, but that priest was the worst one I've ever served, he said, as he put his arm around my shoulder and we started walking down the hall. So you're like a genie, but with unlimited wishes? I asked. Oh, God, no, don't compare me to them. Genies are... ooh he said. As we reached the office, he explained that he would handle anything I asked him to. Apparently, he has some pretty great powers, and I tested them out by having him create a pizza for me, as I had forgotten to pack a lunch that night. He was able to whip one up in seconds, even providing a beer to go with it. I had him fix the wall for me and zap in a few different things before the night ended. He informed me that he was tied to the building for the short term and that he would come back out for each of my shifts to keep me company and help however he could. This seemed like a great setup at first, but it's become a nightmare in recent weeks. Every night he asks me to help with random tasks around the building. These are things he says he can't do, like painting odd symbols on things and moving things around. It's getting to the point that I'm not comfortable being around him but he threatened to come for me if I don't return each night to help him out. When I ask what we're doing, he just tells me to chill out, usually placating me with beer. Some of the symbols he's asked me to paint look familiar, and I think I saw them in the book when I found it, but I'm not allowed to see it anymore as he's hidden it away. I thought about telling George, but I've been forbidden from telling anyone with the threat of death, and I'm at risk even writing this now. I think he's planning something, but I'm not sure what, and I'm not sure that I want to know at this point. If you're reading this, it may already be too late. There's an eerie feeling in the building now, and with each new symbol I draw, I swear I can hear the howling from the basement growing louder. I used to love working the third shift, but now I'd do anything to avoid it. Okay, so that was I accidentally summoned a demon. <laughs> and the, the, kind of a creepier ending, you know? It's kind of the, the, the what's going to happen, what's going to... It almost feels like there should be more to it, a longer story. Uh, sometimes that's just the way they come out, you know? I've <laughs> had plenty of stories on both ends of that where it's like a, a final, final ending, and then like, what else could happen? And so before we go any further, I'm going to go ahead and let you know 
The first one, A Whispering Garden, was AI written. <laughs> the second one, I summoned a de- I accidentally summoned a demon, was written by me. And if you know my stories, if you've if you've listened to my other stories, you might have been able to pick up on it. If you had never listened to any of my stories before and you were just kind of going with them, both of them off of the first time you're hearing anything, it's tempting to say either one, in my opinion, could have been written by a person. And that's kind of the scary part about the whole AI thing is it's it's eerie how good it can <laughs> come up with things. Now, as far as new concepts, it has trouble with new concepts. Um, I did a little experiment. If you if you watch me on YouTube, you know I've got a, a series called GPS Signal Lost. And it's about a guy named Charlie that go, he's traveling around the country. He's fallen into, uh, basically, he's, he's like all alone. In the, and he's trying to figure out what's going on in the world. And he's got a, a mannequin girlfriend named Lisa, <laughs> a little stuffed dinosaur, stegosaurus named Kyle, and a st- little statue of Bigfoot named Steven. That's kind of his his group that goes around with him. And as they go, they're becoming more lifelike, and, and there's a lot of little quirks and fun little things that happen throughout the story. But I, I just I went into chat GPT and I was like, hey, here's the parameters for the story. I give it a baseline. I say, write a story and let's see what it comes up with. And it never comes up with anything anywhere close to what I came up with. So the creativity of AI isn't quite there yet. I, 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 I want to be careful with that because it's technically being creative. You know, I, I took the prompt, basically what I started with as far as an idea for GPS signal loss, and I plugged that into AI. It was like, here, this is what you need to go with. Tell me what story you come up with. And it comes up with like a story of a, of a guy just stuck at a rest stop and he gets confused and he doesn't know what's going on and then he falls back out of the you know, he's not in it anymore. Um, when I tell it to, you know, write as if he's in a, you know, writing it in a journal and it, it gets him stuck there and he just doesn't know what's going to happen. But it's not anywhere near what I came up with to start with. Now, does that mean that it's less creative? Not necessarily. But could it have come up with that concept? It's hard to say. It really is, because honestly, as a as a human writer, and that's not to say that AI will never be able to come up with that kind of stuff. But right now, the state that it's in, it can come up with some pretty good stuff. And it's all a matter of taste. You know, what do you like and what do you eh, if you listen to, you know, for, for me, I'm proud of chat, uh, of GPS signal loss because I feel like it's a creative, fun story. Uh, I bring. I work really hard to bring the characters to life and bring the world to life. And I feel like AI just isn't there. Like it just isn't in a situation where it could do that. So honestly, I don't know if we as writers or artists should necessarily be afraid of it. I think there will always be people out there who are interested more in the, the stories and making sure that they're written by people. The problem comes with companies. Honestly, that is 100% where the issue lies. These, these companies, these big corporations that would rather, would you rather pay an artist or a writer hundreds of thousands of dollars, potentially more, for coming up with a concept, writing a story, spending all the time doing it, and paying the editors and all of that kind of stuff that goes along with it? Or would you rather just have a AI come up with a story and spit out something on a regular basis? And that's where it kind of comes down to. What is, what's the downfall? And for companies, that's going to be it. That's going to be what they're looking for is can we use this? How, how, how can we use this to get rid of writers? How can we use this to get rid of the creative people regardless of what kind of creativity AI has? Because at the end of the day, AI is just ingesting everything humans have ever done and spitting it back out in different ways. And that doesn't make it wrong or bad or or anything other than because realistically, as a writer, as an artist, we all take inspiration from somewhere and AI does the same thing. So if we're sitting there taking inspiration from different things and AI is taking the inspiration from different things, it's just a matter of the creativity and how creative do you have to be, you know, versus how creative do people want to see? 
And honestly, I think that the only thing we can really do as a society, as a group, is refuse anything we know is AI generated, as far as from a creative standpoint. You know, if if <laughs> if stories, if if movies, if things like that are AI generated, the best thing we can do is say, no, we want real artists doing this. We want people to get paid to do this. Realistically, honestly, to tell you the truth, if AI winds up taking over to the point where most jobs and everything else are AI run, we're going to have to get past money anyways as a society. And at that point, it's up to creatives, you know, people, it's up to people to search out whatever they want to see creatively. That's where I think that the battle is going to come in because companies are, are doing this because they want to save money and they want to make more money. <laughs> but the problem is, what if nobody's working and making any money? How are you selling that product? You're not making any money off of your product anymore. What are you thinking? What are you doing? You know, there's a, there's got to be a threshold there because at some point, the money you're making doesn't buy you anything. You know, at some point, 80% of the population is out of a job. <laughs> whatever movie or book or whatever you're doing isn't being sold because you put it on the shelf for $19.99, but nobody can buy it because nobody has a job and money becomes worthless, you know? So we got to think about it from that standpoint too. Like how far does this actually go? And if money's not involved, if money's not a, an object anymore, well, hell, at that point, does it matter? You know, if I can sit here all day and write stories and put stories out and, and, and people can read them and listen to them on YouTube or whatever, but I don't have to worry about paying any bills. Does it matter if I'm really making that much money? You know, where's the line there? What what matters? So that's all stuff that I've been thinking about with AI. when it comes to AI. I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think we need to embrace it for certain things. I think more than anything else, if you haven't looked at it yet, if you haven't played around with it yet, go out and do that. Because at least familiarize yourself with it, even if you're not using it on a regular basis so that you don't get left behind because this is the future this this technology is going to be used in a daily basis it already is in a lot of ways but it's going to become even more ingrained in our lives over the next 5 10 15 20 years and if you don't get started now if you don't get, keep up with it now when that time comes you're going to be catching up and you don't really want to be in that situation even if you don't want to use it on a daily basis at least know how it works at least be familiar with it. And honestly, if you're an author and you're trying to sell your work, use it as a marketing manager. You know, come up with your own stuff and come up with your own, like write your own bare bones. This is what the book is about. And then have it come up with the marketing idea for you. You know, you can ask it, what's a good marketing plan? What's a good, you know, if I want to do this, what's a good step by step program to do this? And it will provide you with that kind of stuff. So that's something to, to think of. As an author or even as an artist with your work and trying to get that out there, it can give you some pretty good tips and ideas. Uh, if you're growing a business, if you're running, if you're writing books, whatever you happen to be doing, it's a really helpful thing. So it's something to at least get, you know, get used to, get familiar with, and let, don't let yourself fall behind. So I think <laughs> we'll see how this goes if you're on YouTube. You can see me. Hi, how's it going? If you're everywhere else, if you're on a podcast platform, hey, hit the hit the hit the rate button. Rate, give me a thumbs up or five stars or whatever whatever rating system happens to be on whatever you're listening on. Rate the podcast. That would be awesome. And maybe leave a review if you if you don't mind, because uh, that kind of stuff helps. You know, it helps me get the word out and helps me get my name out there. If you're on YouTube, like the video, comment. All, all the interactions, just all of the interactions. It helps push the video and the algorithm. YouTube's algorithm is a pain in the ass. <laughs> so any anything at all helps. Like it, dislike it, whatever you want to do. It helps in the algorithm. So do all of the good stuff. And subscribe on YouTube if you aren't already subscribed. Because, you know, hey, you've made it what's essentially an hour into the video. <laughs> I don't know exactly how long this will wind up being in the end. But it'll be close to an hour. So, you know, subscribe, all that good stuff. But that's all I got. The uh, The next podcast will come out in two weeks. Every other week is a podcast. But uh, if you go over to my YouTube channel, you know, like I said, 
I've got GPS Signal Lost. That's the series that comes out every Wednesday. I've got short horror stories every Friday for the most part. <laughs> We're starting up cemetery chats. I've got a that's a whole nother series which I've talked about in other podcasts. But that's something that you you might like. It's just random topics. My wife and I sit in the cemetery in chairs and talk about whatever floats our boat. And there's some crazy topics coming out this this year. So if that's something that interests you, that's also on YouTube. But that's all I got for now. Everybody have a great rest of your day. And uh, I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>